Good morning, and I welcome everyone to the 13th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee and our second remote formal meeting. I thank the Broadcasting Office for their work helping organise this meeting, as always, and I ask everyone to ensure their mobile phones are on silent. Apologies have been received from Sarah Boyack. Pauline McNeil will attend as a substitute member, and I welcome Pauline McNeil to the committee. Agenda item one, as this is Pauline's first meeting, I ask her to indicate whether she has any relevant interest to declare. Pauline? Thank you. No relevant interest to declare, Convener. Thank you very much. Agenda item two, today's main business will be an evidence session on homelessness and COVID-19. For agenda item two, we have consideration of whether to take agenda item five in private. Item five is consideration of the evidence taken by members. As we are meeting remotely, rather than asking whether everyone agrees, I will instead ask if anyone objects. If there is silence, I will assume you are content. Does anyone object? Thank you very much. I am taking that silence as agreement, so therefore that is agreed. Item five will be taken in private, along with consideration of the work programme, which we agreed to take in private at our last meeting. Agenda item three is an evidence session on COVID-19 and homelessness. We will be taking stock of the effect of the crisis and homelessness, including what we hear have been some positive developments. And we will be discussing how to sustain any gains into the longer term once the crisis has abated, as well as any longer term challenges the crisis may create. Today, I welcome Alistair Bennett, Chief Executive, Bethany Christian Trust, Margaret Ann Brunez, Chief Executive, Homeless Network Scotland, and Mike Wright, Senior Service Manager, Outreach Services, Cyrenians. We have a maximum of 90 minutes for this session to our panellists. I would say we're delighted to have you here to share your experiences with us and your views with us, and we do really appreciate it. We want to make the best use of our time to discuss this important issue. If another panellist has already given a full answer to a particular question and you feel you don't need to add anything, do feel free to say so and leave it there. That will give us more time to move on and to explore other issues with you all. As we're dealing with the panel today, for the benefit of broadcasting, I will call each panellist before you speak in response to a question. I also ask witnesses and members to please give broadcasting staff a few seconds to operate your microphones before you speak. So I will now move straight to questions. And I want to start off with asking a couple of questions around rough sleeping. How <clears throat> there's clearly been extra funds made available to uh, deal with the, the rough sleeping crisis and during this time, but how are the current plans sustainable once the emergency funding has ceased? And how do you think rough sleepers will be able to be accommodated once that has this time has passed? We do we have any particular any panelists that would like to respond to that? Mike, you're on camera, would you want to respond to you? Am I on there? Okay. Um, I think that there are a number of opportunities. We have seen uh, people moving into hotels, particularly in Edinburgh. We have around about 245 um, hotel beds that have been provided on top of normal temporary accommodation. So we're in a position where um, rough sleeping is at a much lower lower level than, than normal, and um, we would like we think there's some measures we could take to help increase this. Uh, for example, we in Edinburgh we traditionally have a we have a low percentage of our, our overall housing stock is available for social rent. However, one of the changes that's made a real difference has been the adjustment of the rate of housing benefit um, for for Edinburgh, and that has meant that the stock of, of private rented properties has suddenly become uh, an option for people to so in, in, in effect increase the portfolio of options. Um, Generally, there are normally only um, a handful of properties that people can access um, in, who are in receipt of housing benefit. However, that number has increased dramatically. So there's there's one option um, in terms of housing people going forward. In Scotland, we've made quite a bit of progress over the the last few years uh, in how we respond to homelessness generally. And one of the, the key drivers for this, from my perspective, has been the Housing First Scotland program. Um, Housing First has been uh, successful in Edinburgh and actually across Scotland, but in Edinburgh we have uh, just over 100 people in support, and there is capacity there to, to increase the, the people who receive that support, and I would see that as a good way to help people 
um, transition from some of the temporary arrangements that we have in hotels, etc., into what we would all like to see a permanent home of, of their own. Thank you. Uh, Margaret Allen? Thank you. Um, thank you. Well, we see the question of rust peeling as something that actually sits um, right at the heart um, of three key and linked concerns um, in terms of how we recover quickly um, from this pandemic. Um, the, the, the issue of rust peeling, um, of course, is um, something that we've all observed, something really remarkable that's happened over the last 10 years in terms of how quickly all different parts came together to resolve the situation almost overnight. To the point where there's now, you know, kind of, um, you know, less than a handful of people sleeping off in, 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 in each of the cities. And um, so that in itself is supposed to re rethink of what's possible. But it also means that where we are right now um, is on um, a bit of a knife edge. And I say that because what we've not done is solved the problem. Um, we've contained it. And that does move us further forward. Um, but, it, but it hasn't solved the problem completely. So the next steps that we're going to take um, on rough sleeping will really mean everything in terms of how we can lock down this progress that's been made over the last um, 10 weeks um, or, or, or the risk actually of just letting it um, slip away. And very, very quickly, if I could just summarise the, the kind of two points that link to that in terms of what the key concerns are. And the first is that alongside rough sleeping um, is that this pandemic has really created the same conditions that create homelessness. So we already know that the risk of homelessness is not distributed um, equally, um, and nor is the risk um, of this pandemic and what all it brings um, both directly and indirectly. So if we understand poverty as being the overwhelming key driver of homelessness and how that kind of interacts with local housing and employment markets, it means that what we risk going forward um, is seeing more people exposed to homelessness, and not because of anything that they've done, just because those um, kind of cards were stacked against them. The homelessness does discriminate, um, and I think what we all recognise from this kind of pandemic is that it does too. And, and what this means is this, you know, kind of mounting pressure that people are having, those um, kind of additional money worries, job insecurity, the kind of imperfect welfare state um, that we're operating within. All of those have been made harder um, by the pandemic, and they'll all put more people um, at risk of homelessness. And, and just to kind of finish that circle. And, Sorry. Could you please, please, yeah. If you don't mind, if I could just 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 the final point, the three things are so closely linked in terms of what the kind of key concerns are. Is that the third part is that of course over this pandemic, while there has been all that amazing energy, is that the housing systems have stalled. Um, so and if we remember the kind of key issue blocking progress in homelessness before the pandemic was the scale of the temporary housing system and the time people spend within it. Um, and, and of course, the key mechanism um, and the right solution to that was the rapid rehousing planning framework that local authorities were working through. But over the last um, kind of 10 weeks, we've seen hundreds more people now go into that temporary system, making it bigger, with very little movement into settled housing. So that means that for some local authorities, particularly those with the biggest challenge, they kind of started bursting at the seams now um, in terms of um, the, the kind of scale of that problem. So the impact has been larger uh, kind of backlogs of homeless households in the system, people spending more time um, kind of homeless, more people and more spend in temporary accommodation. And of course, this bit that we're most concerned about is this potential spike in homelessness after um, the lockdown. So it all does feel a bit of a race um, against time. And there are some ideas and solutions that I know we'll go on to, but, but just to kind of summarise the concerns from our perspective and also representing this collective of organisations that have come together. Those are the three key ones. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's very helpful, and I'll be coming on to uh, some of that uh, briefly. But uh, Alistair, would you like to come in on this point? Yes, um, certainly. Um, just echoing uh, what's already been shared by Mike and Margaret Ann, um, and adding to just a few statistics, really, sort of fleshing out the numbers that we've been supporting. So. Across the main cities in Scotland, there has been a, a fantastic collaboration with local authorities, with Scottish Government support, with loads of third sector charities coming together to support people into hotels and then uh, and other temporary accommodation, support them not only in those hotels but with wraparound support, good levels of multidisciplinary support, health interventions, introducing not just the housing and, and the, the fact that people have a, a single occupancy space. But making sure that there's there's good levels of 
case management and support for individual needs. The numbers that we've been supporting are a big concern for the future in terms of as those temporary measures um, or, or funding for those potentially cease. And so we have been thinking about innovating what we're going to do next. Um, I think that's going to have to be a partnership approach. I don't think anyone's in disagreement that we all need to do something. Um, just to give you some, some figures, the care shelter in Edinburgh, which is now operating from the Old Waverley Hotel, um, since September, um, which is when it opens each year, um, we've seen over 900 people. So it's not like a fixed set group of people that we support. We've seen over 900 people there. In the Glasgow City Missions um, night shelter, they saw 606 people over just short of four months. So it's not a static group. And at the moment, we're supporting in the hotel, as are various other charities, supporting people to move on from them already. So they're not necessarily staying there waiting till the hotels cease to operate, but supporting people to move on um, into temporary accommodation, into supported accommodation in the city. Naturally, opportunity for tenancy move on just now is limited, but we're confident as we approach the potential kind of scaling down of those um, provisions that we'll be able to support those that are in the accommodation at that time into something appropriate. My concern shared by many is that that's not the end of the picture and there is a real risk of further spike. We've seen the numbers of presenting people increasing. Normally be 26 people a week at the care shelter in Edinburgh, it's now 40 a week. Um, so that's going up and what we're going to do collectively um, to support those that enter into a rough sleeping predicament um, going forward beyond July is a, is a key, key question. Okay, thanks very much for that. That, and that takes me on just nicely to my next question because the whole issue is going to be what happens when this extra funding is is no longer available or is tapering off. And obviously, there's been a lot of good practice. Everybody deserves huge applause for the amount of work that they've done and, and get put together. But how do we see them working together? For example, local authorities are going to be hit with a spike after this about uh, trying to make sure that people go into houses. Do we? Would, would local authorities change in their allocation process, for example, to uh, help in any way to make sure that some of these people who are now in temporary accommodation or, uh, are, are moved into council accommodation instead of swaps, maybe making the, the priority to make sure that people get in the, the, that type of accommodation? Yeah, I'll happy to pick that up initially. Um, there's been, a, I think, there's been three key things that have changed in my estimation of it. One is there has been a suspension of a number of systemic barriers that people face, particularly for those with no recourse to public funds. There's also been the suspension or the temporary um, ban on evictions into homelessness for for a period. So there's, there's a number of systemic elements that have changed, and already um, local authorities are supporting people into accommodation that they might not normally have done. Um, the other thing that's changed is the availability of accommodation because the, of the of the tourism uh, being so impacted, which has allowed accommodation opportunities that didn't exist previously. And the third factor has been there has been grant funding available at a level that that has not been previously seen, and so that has enabled all this mobilisation that was ready to happen to then come about. I think um, there's already discussions around all of that with local authorities around how we can sustain and support. This particular group, uh, and, and I think there will be good progress being made on that already this morning in calls and, and, and looking at that across across the piece. Uh, again, it's about those that are those that newly present to it that will be a big concern. I'll pass on to somebody okay, else. You. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Alistair. I've just shared, have I? I think. Sorry, mate. I mean, right. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I thought I might. Yeah, I don't be hogging it now. I, I, I largely agree with what Alistair said. Um, I think we need to pay special attention to some of the, the points of transition issue um, based on what um, Margaret Ann was sharing around about the increased pressures on households. We should be thinking about things like people who are. Uh, for example, leaving hospital who have um, significant health challenges, people who are leaving uh, the prison system or 
you know, any of these sorts of points of transition pre present an inherent risk as well, and perhaps we will need to expand our, our reach somewhat to try and make sure that any response takes account of people making those, those changes in their lives as well. Okay, thank you. And Margaret Anne, I'm pretty sure I've got you right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, the question is exactly the right one. Um, there is there's no going back, and we all know that. Um, but also, we can't stay where we are. Um, and I guess probably one of the most important points we would want to make round about that is that the Scottish government, the Scottish Parliament, actually, and, and, and this committee particularly, has already shown incredible ambition in round about homelessness um, since the inquiry back in kind of 2017 and into 2018. Um, and, and together, kind of chose a method for ending homelessness that is incredibly clear and that is backed um, by evidence. Um, and that, of course, is the rapid rehousing framework that, that local areas are working to. Now, the really boring response within all this is that that rapid rehousing framework is exactly the right method to step us out of this pandemic and all the additional damages to homelessness that it potentially does. It's the right framework. We've heard local authorities saying that it. That already gives them the platform for recovery. If they didn't already have this rapid rehousing approach, they would need it. Um, but the bit that needs to go alongside that, I think, is what this pandemic has showed us, um, which has been the level of urgency, which has been remarkable. Um, now, homelessness is always a crisis, um, and, and particularly for the people that it affects, it's always urgent, but our systems don't always act like it. Um, and, and I think what's shown us over the, like, in the last 10 weeks is that when we really bring all these parts together, housing and health, local and national government, and the third sector, and those volunteering um, the groups in, in local areas, when we really bring that together and act with urgency, much more can be achieved. So I think it's that learning and that thinking that we need to now apply to the framework of, of rapid rehousing that we had before. I think alongside that, there's a, a number of other things that we need to do to just mitigate against um, those impacts. Um, and, and we've covered um, several of them already, so just um, stepping over any that we already have. But of course, we really need to prioritise prevention, and it just has to come first. We know when we have situations like recessions and you know, pandemics, we know what the groups are most at risk, and we really need to direct urgent efforts um, toward them. The sooner the better, really, um, and starting now. Um, we need to get back and try it with rapid rehousing. We need to now more housing options and opportunities across all tenures. We need to really up the game in terms of our use of um, the kind of private rented sector and, and how that is deployed um, locally. We need to create the space now for big policy and incentives about increasing capacity um, across all tenures. And I'm really rethinking and looking again at uh, you know, kind of initiatives like flat sharing. Incentivising households to downsize where that's what they want, and um, looking at out of area housing allocations again where that's what the household want. There are, are different ways of, of doing this, but, but within all of it, what we need to really keep a hold of is space and scale. So some of the initiatives that come up um, will in scale um, only affect a fraction of the amount of people that if we really want to do this, if we really want to you know, build back stronger from where we were in homelessness before, then we really do need to think big in terms of numbers and in terms of some new ideas and initiatives. One of the things I, I, I was pleased to, uh, to hear was about the, the fact that a lot of the, system, the systemic barriers seem to have just been broken apart. Uh, I think that crucial to this must be the fact that that continues, that we do not go back to the old silo system of working, which I think has been detrimental in many cases to, to uh, what has been happening. So, if, if we get anything out of this, surely it is the fact that people have been working together for some time now. Let us continue to do that, because the reality is that we are coming out of a pandemic at some stage into what is going to be very, very difficult financial times, and we are going to have to work together to make sure that if it's going to, if, if we're going to continue to do what we're doing, we're going to have to do it all working hand in hand, really. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. Uh, good morning, Jeremy. Convener, um, and thank you. Can I just remind uh, members that I am a non-executive director of Bethany Christian Church. <laughs> um, I, I want to just move off uh, rough sleeping, but. Before we do that, just one very kind of practical, quick question, um, and that is, when we get to September, and if there's no use of a hotel here in Edinburgh and in Glasgow, and with social distancing, how do we accommodate 
people who are rough sleeping in the short term. Because my understanding is about 700 people on an average night are rough sleeping across Scotland. That presumably is a challenge of how we help those individuals with social distancing. And I just wonder, you know, we can think about long term and medium term, but come September, how do we deal with that? Um, I don't know whether Alistair wants to go first and then others follow. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Um, it's a big question. It's one that we are t uh, taxing ourselves with just now, discussing together in various networks with um, it, it, with charitable interests, with stakeholders such as local authorities and um, Scottish government, and with yourselves today. It is one of these areas that we want to see the re reduction and end of rough sleeping, but. What does that mean for the interim? What does that mean in the moment of crisis? And so we're looking at the model of accommodation, the night shelter in Glasgow, the care shelter, there's two night shelters in Glasgow, the care shelter in Edinburgh. The model is one of relieving immediate suffering, um, making sure people, sure people have shelter, food, warmth, safety, but as soon as is possible, supporting them to move into accommodation. Therefore, we have 65, 70, percent of people stay seven nights or less, 50 percent of people stay two nights or less in these environments. So looking at the public health setting going into September, October and beyond, we are going to need to look at <clears throat> ensuring that the accommodation model is, is different to the congregate model in some respects, yet there is strength to that model also in terms of providing safety, providing oversight and with the volume of people, um, it's something we're going to have to think through. So, for ourselves um, and for I know the partners in Glasgow are similar, essentially looking at different uh, models of accommodation for this winter. I think it brings into focus, as has been shared, what can be achieved if there's an unlocking, a removal of barriers and funding. And we have sought accommodation uh, previously on, and on many occasions. It's not simple to acquire in Edinburgh, for example. Um, there might be opportunities that are opened up through this because some accommodation might not be required um, for other purposes. So these are the kind of things we're looking at. But it's a big, it is a, a big question. Our, our plan um, would be to operate emergency support and shelter for people, but in a in a in a different model of accommodation. Okay, uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to come in. Morgan. Um, um, Thank you. Um, I mean, I guess just to, to add to what Alistair was saying is that the bit I think that we all understand is that we spend a lot of money on homelessness, but we don't always spend it in the most um, effective or evidence based way. That it actually costs much more to keep people homeless, um, and particularly people that are sleeping rough in and out um, of that cycle. So, so this idea of it getting quickly back on track with housing led responses, getting people into ordinary housing in ordinary communities is better for people um, and it's also more cost effective national, um, nationally and locally. The, the second thing I think just on the, on the rough sleeping point is that if we really want to end rough sleeping in Scotland, then we have to mean everyone. And, and I think on a um, on, on a week where we've heard um, kind of other leaders in other parts not even familiar with um, kind of issues that people have around about having no recourse to public funds. Then we have a real opportunity to take a different road here, um, and the collective of organisations that we're involved in are all uh, absolutely on the same page with needing to see how ambitious Scotland can be, and looking to see how much support that we can offer that to ensure that we can get everybody in um, with a minimum decent accommodation. Right. Um, I largely agree, actually, with Alistair and, and Margaret Ann. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jerry? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for answer. I wonder if I can move on um, just to one other issue, and that is around the unsuitable accommodation orders. Um, I think one of the issues is that once you move someone on uh, to from rough sleeping into bed and breakfast or other accommodation, but often it's unsuitable, uh, particularly for uh, children um, and maybe uh, families. I'm just wondering, Obviously, that has been suspended at the moment um, due to the crisis. But again, just some thinking about going forward in the medium term, 
a light and suitable accommodation? How do we get away from putting people into bed and breakfast, which really isn't uh, meeting their needs and is detrimental to their health, both physical and mental? Uh, Mike, would Maybe you like Margaret, to one time? Well, let Mike in first if he wants to speak in this. Yes, um, I think it, it, quite, it's a good question. The, the pandemic has actually shone quite a, a scrutinising light upon uh, some of the ways that we respond to homelessness in terms of some of the, uh, the, the accommodation models, etc. Um, I think there's probably a job that we have to, in the first uh, stage, connect with people, and maintaining that connection has been. I guess the focus a lot of the lot of the work, particularly with people who are rough sleeping and not able to maintain social networks and actually access information of their own in relation to the COVID nineteen outbreak. Um, I think Ed, uh, certainly locally, Edinburgh is doing a fair amount of work in converting what uh, its sort of higher use of bed and breakfast accommodation into more like a, a shared house model, where I guess people have better access to their own facilities and are able to. Um, to live more in line with the principles of self-isolation, so access to their own facilities, etc. That, that's a journey that we're on. I'm, I'm pleased to, to see that that, that is, is part of the, the work that's going on. Um, I think the answer will always be to try and uh, pro provide people with permanent accommodation as quickly as possible, um, so that they do have the, the access to their own facilities and that they have all the dignity that that brings. Thank you, Margaret Ann. And I think this um, kind of traditional um, approach to homelessness, which was an expectation that people would live in kind of shared, sometimes crowded, and um, kind of congregate unsuitable types of temporary accommodation, is something that we've already really started to leave behind um, in Scotland. And I think particularly in this post-pandemic society, this idea about having people in those types of shared to in close proximity just isn't a goer. So it just accelerates, I think, um, the ambition um, that they had before. Everything is so connected, um, of course, that it, that it really just takes us back to the primary point um, of the need to restart um, kind of social housing um, commitments um, and, and, and house building um, commitments um, to get the whole housing market and temporary housing market moving um, again, so that we can create the type of capacity and opportunities for people that are in unsuitable accommodation to move into something more suitable and more settled. Thank you. Um... And Alistair? Yeah, well, we welcome the, the order. And um, I think the only potential risk is there might be some unintended consequences. And I think that the local authority is going gonna, gonna to have to be an additional investment into some of the accommodation that currently exists. Um, we would we would favour, I've seen many lives um, transformed in a moment of shared accommodation if it's high quality. And if it's got a high level of support, and it can be the lowest point for a person potentially, but it can be a springboard for them to be supported into the next stage of their of their independent living. It's not to accommodate anybody in that situation um, because there's no flats available. It's because they might have a particular addiction recovery need, or it might be women fleeing domestic violence. It might be young people who are moving through care or after coming up after care. It might be older people who need support um, with managing addiction for a longer period, but it's supporting them into uh, and promoting their independence. So I think we need more commissioned, supported, high support accommodation. I think we need, um, in, I mean, the obvious one, of course, we need more homes. Um, one of the priorities that we've been um, highlighting in partnership with Homeless Network Scotland and, and with um, 19 charitable and academic groups is more homes for better health. So seeing homelessness under the banner of health is really key, um, that it's not just a housing issue, which we've all known for many years, but just under the banner of health, how much more can be achieved if it becomes so urgent? Um, so we would see that as being key as well and, and supporting people um, on from whatever accommodation they're in now into more appropriate accommodation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. I'm, I'm going to move on to Pauline now. Uh, Pauline, uh, and before before Pauline asks her question, can I just ask the panel, as best they can? I know this is a very complicated issue, but as best they can, can they just keep their answers a wee bit shorter so we can get through everything today? Thank you, Pauline. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I wanted to um, ask the panel and Margaret, and in particular, um, who talked about um, concepts of flat sharing out of area allocations uh, and the importance of keeping people in their own in their tenancies. So, um, the question is really around how you avoid further further spiking homelessness. So, at the moment, um, there's a ban on evictions, and I think there's Certainly, some expectation or worry that at the end of that period, uh, we don't know the full picture, but many people may uh, be at risk of losing their tenancies and may become homeless. So, so that's the kind of area I just wanted to explore. Um, so, there's the issue of the number of people, uh, young people and women in particular, who have been in precarious work. There's also a cohort of people who maybe have never experienced any kind of drop in income or uh, homelessness before, but they haven't been covered by one of the government schemes, uh, which is why I was quite keen um, to discuss with the government how tenants could be helped and why there should be a tenants fund to do that. Um, you don't need to comment on that, but I just wondered if you shared the same uh, concerns and what we should be doing to try and avoid that spike in homelessness at the end of that period. Thank you. It's, it's definitely the case, as we discussed in uh, the start, the, the people that are most exposed to risk around about homelessness will be also be most exposed um, to some of the fallout um, from, from COVID and its immediate aftermath. So the issue of um, the kind of very welcome um, pause on evictions for that six-month period, the collective um, that we're standing together with is, is looking to have that extended to a 12-month um, period. It's a much more pragmatic and realistic timescale um, to enable people most at risk and um, with most other worries to just step out um, of this pandemic a bit more safely and um, with a bit more time to remedy um, kind of any issues that they have. What we're also asking for is no evictions into homelessness um, at all. Now, we recognise there are situations where some you know, evictions are not avoidable for, for many reasons, particularly you know, the safety and well-being of um, you know, local people. But the idea that, particularly within the type of legal framework that we have in Scotland, that we could evict people back into homelessness and then continue to have a duty to rehouse people um, is a waste of time and uses resources, um, and it uses the scarce um, housing capacity that there is, and particularly in, in, in some areas. Um, so I think when, when we're looking at all the kind of different ideas about how we can quickly create housing capacity um, now, it's on the basis that we need to look at this as a kind of cross-country and cross-tenure uh, challenge, um, and, and not look at it um, as, a, as, as through such a you know, sort of, uh, specific lens as we have done before. There are some people um, that, given the opportunity, would be prepared to look at their housing situation and solution differently than they might have in the past, and we need to give people those opportunities. And so long as we can hold firm to the principle of choice and control and people directing that, um, then, then I think we have um, legitimate space to start thinking about more kind of creative ways um, of ensuring that everybody can get home. Pauline? Thank you very much. Um, could you press you a bit further, Margaret Ann, on this suggestion um, that the no eviction period should be 12 months? Um, and any thoughts you might have about how that how the government could support that, what need, would need to be done and put in place? Um, on the face of it, it seems a sensible suggestion, but obviously there are some details you know, need to be worked through as to how um, we could support um, a policy like that. I think it's exactly that. I mean, there, there is quite a lot of thinking um, that would need to be um, pulled together quickly from lots of different parts of the system to enable that to happen kind of coherently um, and safely. But if we put people um, at the heart of this and what they are going to need to, um, to get a step out of this pandemic, it's a very pragmatic, obvious, um, and, and compared to others, um, quite immediate um, solution that we can put in place to just protect people and, and, and ensure the security of home and health um, over the next uh, you know, for the six months. Can just a very quick question to finish off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the same subject, Margaret Ann, um, I wonder if you agreed with me that in some scenarios where people might need help for three or four months, 
because of the impact of the crisis, the pandemic crisis. If we could support people through maybe a short period of three to four months, we might be able to actually stop a, a higher number of evictions. I think that's exactly right. Um, um, I mean, evictions often escalate over relatively um, kind of short periods of time. Um, there could also be issues that have contributed to that, that, that have um, existed for a longer um, period of time. Um, particularly when we look at you know, the most um, kind of pragmatic issue of um, kind of building up rent arrears or just personal debt um, or just real money worries um, that, 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 that are accumulating, we know for so many um, people at the moment, um, there must be something quickly we can put in place um, to protect those people. We just um, over this last weekend, uh, just to, to illustrate, we do the Scottish Government's Wellbeing Fund, we're able um, to open up a fund for people in temporary housing, so in homeless temporary accommodation. Um, it was a hundred thousand fund, and we were opening a universal rate of a hundred pounds for people um, that, that were staying here. And that fund had to close um, within two and a half days um, because of the level of need that there is out there um, for cash. Um, so there is uh, loads of food um, and other types of resources are, are available, but people are skint and people are having real money problems. Um, and I think the more that we can take a housing uh, perspective on that, particularly in terms of rent um, and the ultimate impact in terms of eviction, then, then the better that we can support people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do any of the other two panellists have anything short that they'd like to add to that? No? Okay, thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, and it's now Annabelle. It's Annabelle. Uh, along. You can be there. Yeah. Uh, and thank you to our panelists and thank you for coming along today uh, and indeed for all the work that you do day in and day out uh, to tackle homelessness in, in our country. Um, going back to the issue of the SSI, actually the committee will be looking at uh, shortly on unsuitable accommodation. Of course, um, the 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 Counterbalancing issue is, of course, that whilst the uh, prohibition on uh, a stay beyond seven days in unsuitable accommodation is to be extended erga omnes to everybody um, to reflect the coronavirus pandemic, there is the facility for local authorities uh, not to uh, implement that um, until the 30th of uh, September or the delay of implementation, if needed, until the 30th of September. Just really to Double check your view on that. Do you, do you feel that's a reasonable approach in the circumstances? I think what it seems the government are trying to do is to, to, to put forward the legislation, send the signal, but recognise the reality of the crisis we're currently living in uh, and uh, reflecting other uh, legislation that is, has this 30th September 2020 kind of exceptional. Uh, uh, cut off uh, status. Any views on that from any of the panelists? Uh, Alistair? Alistair. Uh, yes, I think it is reasonable. I mean, as an instrument, um, as a statutory instrument that's brought in um, from one day to the next, um, I think it is reasonable to give that six, well, less than six months now um, period, and, uh, particularly because. In effect, as it's as it's assessed, the hotels themselves are considered to be um, breaching that. So I, I do think it's reasonable. I think there's a lot of work and investment, as I said earlier, that is going to be required uh, into some of the the guest houses and and uh, properties that are procured um, for the purposes of supporting and sustaining people in temporary accommodation. And I think I think that there's a lot to be done actually, um, and six months is is going to be difficult actually for local authorities to, even to fulfil that potentially. Um, so I think having some window is appropriate. The direction of travel okay, has been set, which, which is great. Yeah, I think that's what I took from it, that it, they, they wanted to absolutely send the clear signal about direction of travel, uh, but reflect the real lives that we're all sadly currently living in. Um, on the key issue of availability, that's been talked about obviously across the board in all the answers and discussion thus far. Um, a few thoughts. Um, first of all, uh, again taking into account the route map and where we'll be and, and so forth, 
um, it seems certainly in places like Edinburgh, there's an awful lot of student accommodation, and I just wonder to what extent there may have been discussions, uh, because I understand that the approach of some universities is that they're not going to go completely to the remote. They're going to have a, a mix, but they're not going to back to full, um, you know, 100% face to face. So I, I just wonder if there's some opportunity there. If any of the panelists would like to, I'll just chip respond. in briefly to say yes, um, and that um, universities and hotels approached local councils and Scottish government to say we have provision. Um, so that's something that that's happened already. How long that continues for will depend on their plans, but certainly that's the kind of the kind of models of accommodation that we would explore um, going forward. Right. Um, yes. Okay, Mark. Sorry. Um, right. Well. I, I guess I agree with what Alistair was going to say. I was also um, going to add in that some of the offers from universities, etc., have been used to help accommodate uh, key worker staff from NHS and so on as well. So. Um, there has been an awful lot of work going on in this area, coordinated by um, local authorities, really well, and communicating well with all partners. Annabelle? Yes, I could hear, and I would imagine, sadly, because this uh, crisis is not over by any means. Whatever the first minister uh, announces very shortly, indeed, um, that there would be more scope, uh, certainly for the foreseeable future, to use uh, things like student accommodation. And of course, we'll hear shortly about uh, phase one and, and the possible restart of construction, which again adds to availability, albeit that's not in the immediate short term. Last question would be um, in terms of local authority housing in particular, um, I have heard that uh, at the moment some properties are lying empty because they can't be reallocated because of concerns about social distancing and all the rest of it. How do you see route one? Uh, phase one, rather, of the route map, um, changing that such that we don't see, you know, the, the really regretful situation where actual housing that would otherwise be available isn't available because the way hasn't been found to make available. Do you see phase one changing that? Anything okay. like to? I was just going to make a, um, a kind of comment that we know that there there have been some areas. Um, Social landlords, so council landlords as well as um, you know, kind of registered social landlords that have, um, in very different ways, been able to continue to make um, allocations uh, across this um, kind of ten weeks. Most haven't, but some have. And, and for those that have, what we what we need to do is is to is to draw out um, the learning so that can be quickly shared. So that, as you say, as we move into you know the, the, the kind of first phase, is that we can really just start getting these housing markets moving um, again uh, and the temporary housing systems too. The, the, the point about um, you know kind of unsuitable accommodation and looking at different uh, types of accommodation that we might use, I think there's definitely something that we want to hold firm as well, which is about what we know, what works, which is as much as possible. Um, Enabling people to build and live their lives um, in normal communities in normal housing—that's what works. Um, now, um, of course, there are kind of caveats and, and kind of alternative um, arrangements within that. But as long as we understand what we're doing and describe it um, and recognise that as we come out of the pandemic, there might be the need for other types of solutions um, in the short term. Um, but as long as we don't allow that to kind of take us back in terms of some of our thinking about the direction of travel that we're headed in. Can I just uh, thank uh, Mark and uh, answer? And um, I totally agree uh, that um, uh, we obviously need to look at things with fresh eyes um, in light of the experiences we've been through and what we're going to be going through. In the foreseeable future, and I, I do strongly agree with the point about sharing best practice. Um, it's something that we, as a committee, hear about all the time, and it's always a wee bit frustrating that you know there are gaps. And I'm sure that's certainly something I would wish to pursue when we uh, meet with COSLA, I believe, next week. But thank you very much. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Andy. Thank you very much indeed, um, Convener, and welcome the the panel. Um, I've got a few questions, just starting off with the very recent report from Audit Scotland, which um, obviously uh, was commenting on the affordable housing uh, supply, expressing some concerns that it wouldn't, the target of 50,000 would not be delivered, and that was, that was before the 
considerations around COVID-19 might kick in. But more specifically, picking up an issue that arose in our homelessness inquiry a couple of years ago, namely, and I quote from their summary, there is no evidence available to show that Council's assessment of need informed the specific numbers and tenure balance of the Scottish Government's target. Um, what are your observations on that, particularly in the light of the fact that the affordable housing supply does not appear to me to be making any specific provision uh, to rehouse uh, homeless people? Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, just like a quick response because um, I agree with that. It's important that the number that we're um, targeting, the number that we're building towards, is the right um, number. Um, I know that imminently, I think, in, in two weeks' time, our partners in Shelter Scotland, um, along with the Chartered Institute of Housing um, and um, SFHA, um, will be publishing um, a report for um, what they believe is the right number uh, over the next uh, kind of five years, 2021 20, to 26, um, I think. And, uh, and that's based on an analysis, um, not just of what local authorities need, um, but also factoring in um, what um, would previously be counted as um, people in rooms in hotels, um, as opposed to people that need um, to have their own place um, as part of the community. So, um, assuming that all those kind of factors are calculated, which I do, then the number that that report will publish in a couple of weeks' time um, should should um, be the, the, the target that we work towards. Mike, right, I'll stop. Any comment? Yes. Um, again, just to, to fully agree, I think that the, we've talked about bold action being something that we would request um, of all stakeholders, and particularly um, Parliament and Scottish Government, to to really, you know, uh, recognising there is that project, projected shortfall of fifty thousand by the end of March. Therefore, we need to increase the provisions and projections beyond that so that it catches up and beyond. I think that the there is a lot a lot of the housing associations certainly make sure that um uh, that there are um homeless provision allocations within the um within their tenures and there's a there's a lot of amazing work goes on around that. But it's been regrettable. Going back to a question that Annabelle asked um is is supporting people into housing key work? And could it have been uh, done under that banner? Um, I think it might be phase two, the middle of June onwards, before some of these offices reopen. I don't know, um, but the sooner the better to get people moving into their own tenancy. And there's no question we need an increase in terms of the actual tenancy numbers and the provision and proportion for homeless households initially. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Mike, do you want to comment specifically? Uh, yes, please. Um, I, I, I really very much take on board the point, and I think something we talk a lot about in homelessness is um, a demographic called hidden homelessness. Those who are not necessarily uh, immediately uh, visible. It can quite often include people experiencing domestic violence, um, but there are also people who, for whatever reason, chose not to seek help from their local authorities. It might be that they've had uh, previous negative experiences, etc. And I actually think that, um, in terms of just the, the the numbers and the demographics around rough sleeping, um, the the work that's done that's gone on around providing hotel spaces gives us a, an opportunity to have a tighter grasp on on what kind of numbers we are we're talking about here, because the approach certainly in Edinburgh has been to um, include everyone regardless of their their sort of their status, whether they should be uh, under legislation entitled to accommodation, whether they have recourse to public funds. We actually have an opportunity to reconfigure um, what our, our thoughts are around about the numbers and the, and the types of reasons that force people into to rough sleeping. Okay. Thank you very much. I've got a couple more questions. Just first of all, building on what uh, you've just said, Mike, in terms of people who've been rehoused at the moment during the crisis, as you said, regardless of status, so rehoused um, in response to a crisis. How, how are we going to deal with that when the when the crisis is technically over, in the sense that these people are in uh, a safe place, uh, but in, or, in ordinary circumstances, uh, local authorities would not always have a duty to rehab all of them, but having done so, can hardly kick them out on the streets again. What kind of challenge does that pose? It, it poses a huge challenge, and I think it comes down to um, how we as a society want to respond to uh, that level of, of destitution. I think that we have some quite 
um, difficult choices to make because I do not think there is much of an appetite to see um, any human return to a life on the streets or without income except, and without access to food and some of the things that we all take for granted. Thank you um, uh, very much. Yes, and I, I mean I commend the panelists um, some of the uh, optimism you've showed in terms of how we can embrace the the, the opportunities that are, are, arise here. Particularly, for example, in places like Edinburgh where short-term lets have declined, university accommodation. How can we be much more flexible about the accommodation we have? I mean, my final question is. In the question of the security of those, particularly in private rented housing uh, in general, so not homelessness per se, but the fact that because so many people are facing financial insecurity and may be doing so for quite some time, uh, the concern that post the crisis that, that insecurity will remain, uh, many will be in arrears. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you agree that no one should be evicted um, due to arrears that were accrued directly due to the coronavirus uh, pandemic? Margaret Ann, do you want to come on? Yeah, that? I mean, just absolutely agree with the principle um, that, that it, it, we can't tolerate um, evicting people from homes, particularly in a post pandemic society where we don't know um, what's going to be around the corner in terms of waves or um, you look at a very return of the pandemic. Um, we can't tolerate that being as a result um, of uh, people not having access to enough cash um, to pay their rent. Um, that, that it simply can't be a reason. Um, and, and it's um, you know, the part of the, the, the principle uh, that drives this um, the collective of organisations and the plan that we've developed um, as a result. We, we definitely do, just on the PRS, um, we need to use it better and um, we need to kind of stabilise it as an opportunity um, and make it more accessible um, to people um, in housing needs. Um, particularly um, in, in kind of more pressured housing market areas, um, and, and I suppose specifically in Edinburgh, um, but not only. We, we, we know that the lifting of the LHA rate um, has made more properties more affordable, um, especially in places like Edinburgh, and that needs to quickly capitalise on, doesn't it? Um, you know, we need to, to kind of incentivise and um, kind of encourage landlords, um, you know, who, who, who maybe want a, um, maybe want out that game, um, or or they want. Um, a kind of easier way uh, to remain within it, either through kind of you know PSL um, schemes um, or through expansions of kind of leading, you know kind of social lighting approaches like uh, what homes uh, for, for, for good provide. Um, so there's there's real opportunities within the PRS, but only if we can protect the risks that are associated, particularly with um, eviction as a result of primary Mike, Alistair, any comments? Uh, just to confirm what Maggie Maggie Ann was sharing there, and um, I think essentially we need to think about like making sure there are no evictions into homelessness. Um, so I think it would be sensible, as you've suggested, mortgage companies are supporting people with with potential uh, loosening of of expectations for three months. If there has been rent arrears that is evidentially due to COVID. Um, I think it is absolutely reasonable that suspension of evictions around that should be should be uh, forwarded and, and, and brought within this potential six month extension to twelve months. Um, food poverty is a big concern, as well as fuel poverty. Um, uh, there's a whole lot of other issues that are kind of pressing and increasing across Scotland, and I think I think the the issue is going to become. I think I, I, my view would be what has been significant about all of this has been a top-down directive, and I think for some of these issues, top-down directive from um, from the most senior um, Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government, is what has enabled a lot that, that has then followed, because you have to do it. So it's the same with NRF, NRPF, same with the LHA being amended, the no evictions, these are all top-down directives, and the more that we can do that, the third sector groups are like this is this is what we've been looking for. These are the kind of suspension of systemic barriers that we've been looking for. So, I think it would be sensible. That's an interesting point. The Mike, do you have any comment you'd like to make? 
I think there's quite a lot of research that shows uh, around the, the costs of um, people entering homelessness and, and being in there for any length of time, and it's sort of on a personal level and also on a societal level. Um, and I would suggest that it, you know it's it's not a it's not a route that we particularly want to go down. And on top of that, obviously, it's it's about how on a sort of personal level how we treat people as well and what the response should be to tough times. So I think on balance, if you take into account both those arguments, then I would. Really support no evictions as a consequence of the pandemic. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, thanks very much, Community. That's just for just now. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. Yeah, hi, um, and hello to the panelists. Um, you've, you've you've covered quite a lot of ground, and it's raised some interesting issues. So I just want to. Kind of got quickly go through some of the things you've said. So, so let's make this a quick fire round, if if we can. Um, so first of all, Mike, you described um, changes uh, being made to Edinburgh bed and breakfast, physical changes to the buildings. Can you describe what's actually happening? Yeah. Um, so we are. The, the, I guess the local authority are trying to turn these into. I guess modelling it more on what it might be like to share a flat. So the idea that people would have individual rooms, but that there would be some communal facilities. Um, I think that the bed and breakfasts that have been used as temporary accommodation, sometimes they only had things like, for example, a kettle in the bedroom um, with no access to what I would call proper cooking facilities. Whereas a shared house might have a kitchen that a number of people could use um, with the sort of the fuller range of facilities that we would all expect. Of course, there's difficulties there um, with social distancing if people are sharing facilities. Um, uh, how, how does that work? Um, I think that one of the workarounds for social distancing has been allowing people to book certain slots of, of the, the day that they might be able to use the facilities for. Um, I realise that's not ideal. It's not the same as having home of your own. But um, in terms of, I guess, trying to observe social distancing while at the same time being able to provide, a, a, you know, a space for everyone, that, that's one of the measures that's been taken to enable that to happen. Okay, um, Alistair, um, you run um, a shelter in in Edinburgh um, uh, near uh, Meadowbank. Um, now I visited that with uh, Jer Jeremy Balfour. Um, and I'm just wondering, how, I presume, I think I heard you say that's still operating. You just nod. Yes and no. <laughs> yeah, yes and no. Explain. I'm just wondering, how is how is that actually working now, you know, with 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 the current crisis? So the care shelter is actually um, in a building in Diadem. It used to be a middle bank. Um, it's supported by about 70 churches across um, Lothian and Edinburgh, but the venue we use is up um, just beyond Stenhouse. Um, we were super keen to get single occupancy space with ensuite for the for the guests there, and so we approached the Scottish government to look at providing hotel accommodation. So the care shelter model is still operating, but since the 16th of April, it's been operating from the old Waverley Hotel, um, and in that time. Give an indication about 100, 261 people through that hotel got capacity for up to 70 um, uh, in 65 room summer couples, and we've 199 of those have been new to rough sleeping or new to that potential rough sleeping predicament. So going forward, when I'm talking about accommodation models, um, the, the hotel is booked till middle of July, and one of the concerns for us is we'll support those that are resident at that point and confident about supporting them into alternative temporary accommodation. The big concern yeah. is September, October, going into next winter, um, yeah. we would be planning as normal to do a, a care shelter, as would a, a couple of charities similarly in Glasgow. And what we need to do now is think about what's the, what's the safe accommodation model um, yeah. and where can we acquire that or procure that. Yeah, we, we we can't possibly go back to the old model where you've got you know people just sleeping uh, on on the floor in a hall um, yeah. on mats and the sleeping bags. Um, so I guess you I guess you probably all say we need to probably maintain what we're doing now, give people their own rooms, um, 
hopefully with some kind of well their own facilities yeah so we need yeah, to essentially we are going to need to extend that certainly be well beyond the summer we're going to have to get through the winter as well mm -hmm. yeah the i mean the, the service you visited would have there's it has changed significantly since you were there the original care shelter model uh, with raised beds and shower facilities and laundry and so on but there's no question we would far rather have people in that we, we operate you know we have people in flats we have shared, we have people at individual tenancies we have um single room accommodation but the moment of crisis for somebody obviously was born out of what does what if there's no other safety net and it's the last safety net how can we shelter and support that individual that night and so we are looking at alternative models going forward for like sing, single use of uh, single occupancy accommodation but it's not straightforward because it's going to require investment um and in terms of a, a building yeah okay so coming on to investment and margaret Ann, here's your chance um as you know the committee and it's been referred to we did an inquiry into homelessness um, part of that inquiry we visited finland and saw what they're doing that actually you know led to some of our recommendations and we saw that in Finland they specifically build accommodation for homeless people. I mean, is that something we should be thinking of for Scotland? I, mean, the, I think the bet now that nobody was convincing about in Scotland is the effectiveness and success of um, Housing First. And we were able just a couple of weeks ago to publish our first um, annual report, um, and it showed you know a ninety-two percent um, sustainment rate. Um, and remember, this is along um, among people that have had, you know, the toughest lives, um, you know, and, and kind of going through the hardest times. And um, so that kind of needs to, you know, present um, a statement rate is a really important message um, about housing first. At least part um, of Finland's um, kind of school, as you rightly say, um, is a, you know, the kind of development of shared accommodation projects that operate still in a, you know, kind of flexible and independent, kind of almost maybe flat share um, approach. Um, some of that they call housing first, um, and what it is very close um, is some of the very best supported housing um, that we already have um, in Scotland. So I think part of what, what, what we want to see investment in going forward um, is um, a, a, a more accurate understanding of the scale of need for shared um, accommodation, and more honest conversation about where then that shared accommodation should be located um, in terms of who pays for it. Um, if people really can't manage their own place, even with the intensity of support that comes with housing first, then their key issue probably is in homelessness, in which case those types of shared, you know, kind of therapeutic, best supported housing could sit within broader health and social care and kind of commissioning and, and kind of strategy frameworks would be there. Okay. Have we got time for one more, convener? Yeah, yes, on you go. Thank you. Um, we mentioned rough sleeping earlier on. Um, now, th there was a guy who used to rough sleep near the Parliament. He, he basically lived on a bench just around the corner in the Parliament. He was there for months, maybe maybe up to a year. Now, you know, he's he's gone now. I hope he's okay. I don't know where he is, but he went when when this crisis broke out. So I imagine he's been moved somewhere. I think he was there because he wanted to be there, and there were a number, a number of people who sleep rough, want want to do it. it. Sounds odd, but that's that's the way it is. My concern is, what happens with people like that when we're through this crisis? I, I um, if I can respond to that, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right that that is a dynamic, um, and that is, um, you know, there there are people that would that would make that choice. But the number is incredibly small, um, and I say that like like my colleagues, that you know, people that have you know kind of worked with homelessness for many years, and the number of people um, that, that that come up you know come along our path and um, with that view um, is incredibly small. The, the, the housing first is, is is at least part of the um, response to this as well. So we we know that in Scotland it's working so far for nine out of ten people, and that a large proportion of those um, are people that are sleeping rough or or have the, the types of issues that are associated with. Um, the experience um, of rough sleeping, and um, so it's um, it's a it's a response to the issue of rough sleeping that works, uh, and it's the one that we should be um, thinking about how we scale up most rapidly going forward. 
Yep, the uh, Michael Alistair, do you want to comment? Yes. Yeah, just to confirm, it, it's a very sorry, Mike, on you go. Um I, I was just gonna say that um part of the work that we do is uh, we have a street we street out each team. Um I can't comment on particular individuals' situations because of their, their confidentiality, but I guess what I can say is that um any any individual who takes the time um to put a bit of trust in, in our staff and who maybe is is ready to make that move indoors, um it will be done on their terms and in their pace. So that I would hope that if the person you're talking about has made that decision, it, it's been their decision. And so therefore I would hope that the uh, any measures taken for the pandemic um wouldn't actually impact on his his, uh, his accommodation status and that he would be able to potentially remain in that um, for as long as he wanted, should he choose to do so. However, I do take your point that there will be some people who have, I suppose in the broadest sense, um, a difficult relationship with being cared for, whether that comes in the form of housing or, or any, other, any other method. Yeah, just to confirm that it is, um, thank you. Just, um, it's very rare. Um, it is something that would appear possibly if if when there's crossover, um, and it's not total crossover, far from it, with with maybe street begging, um, quite often that can be the impression. Not that this particular person was street begging necessarily, but the most of the people that we support, um, it's not their aspiration to be in that setting. For the very few that it is, it's we have to look behind that. And one of the things I wanted to emphasize today was just, you know. Compassion is key. Compassion um, for the causes that have led to this. What, what trauma led to this? What uh, what underlying causes exist for a person with his mental health or suffering from addiction, trauma, abuse that they might have experienced? Why is why have I got to the point of thinking I do not want to engage with society? Um, and so, what Mike highlighted there, the trust trust that the frontline workers create and, and and the culture that they create in terms of building that trust is key for somebody thinking, oh. Maybe I can hope again. Maybe I can engage again, and maybe, maybe there's maybe life is worth living. Um, so just just to add that. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much. Can can I just assure Graham? I was actually discussing this individual yesterday, and he is safely in in a, a, some kind of home situation. That's good to know. Okay, thank you. Uh, Okay, this takes us. I should have at the beginning uh, given apologies for Kenneth Gibson. Kenneth uh, has IT problems today, and he, he couldn't join us. So apologies for the delay. Apologies for Kenny. Uh, that so that takes us to the end of the individual questions. But does anybody have any supplementaries they'd like to come in? And if so, could you? Say Andy. Okay, Andy. Yes, thanks very much. Um, obviously, for those of you engaged in in this area of work, a lot has changed, as you say, over the last uh, couple of months. Um, Mike Wright, earlier on in one of your answers, you talked about different models of accommodation. Um, I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that, and are you going to be taking the opportunity to map out specifically? In some detail, where you think homeless services need to go in future, um, get that worked up broadly, get it costed, um, and uh, uh, you know look for political support for that. In other words, are you going to embrace the opportunity now uh, to do things differently in future and make sure that we don't revert to old ways? But but, but specifically uh, as well, uh, elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by these different models of accommodation. Sure. Um, I think that there. I think that the sort of the broad range of issues that, that bring people into homelessness mean that the, we can never, we will never be a one size fits all response. Um, I think we need to look at all manner of different responses. The success that's been achieved with housing first. For some people, things like shared uh, accommodation it will will work well, and there will be some people who require long term supported accommodation, um, even if that is just a small number. In terms of the the aspect of our sort of our ask, um, I might I might actually defer to Maggie because we've come together as a collective, as she's referred to a few times, 
um, with some quite clear some quite clear asks as we see it as in, in the homelessness sector around about what needs to happen next to, to move on from the situation that we're in just now. Yeah, Maggie? Yeah, I wonder if I could come on in, in that particular uh, kind of question from Andy, which is um, a great one. One of the uh, kind of pieces of work that the pandemic put paid to um, or put on hold, um, at least for a few months, and um, was a, um, a significant research project that we were about to launch um, that would be undertaken by Indigo House. Um, and it would have a kind of research advisory group chaired by Dr. Beth Watts from Heriot Watt University. And it was looking exactly at this question that Andy's um, raised, which is about the different types of shared accommodation. Um, how much we need, um, who should pay for it, uh, and what circumstances they should be used, um, what's optimal in terms of size and scale. Um, mm. and because we know there's some fantastic um, kind of accommodation out there that we want to learn best from, so that will be kick-starting um, very soon, um, and, and we hope that we can come back to the committee and, and, and to its partners um, with some findings from that um, bit of work. Thank you. Andy? Thank you very much. That, that would be that, that, that I think that'd be extremely helpful because um obviously we are uh, facing uh big challenge now across a number of areas including um housing and I think the, the the advantage will be to those who can spring forward uh with clearly set out ideas about the way forward um uh, that, that they, they will be in, in in the driving seat so I, I certainly encourage you to kick start that work and thanks that's very encouraging to hear thank you thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Well, <coughs> excuse me. So that completes our questions for today. Can I just thank you very much for for taking part in the meeting? I think that out of this disaster of a pandemic, we have seen a lot of good work, and I think it's stuff that hopefully we'll we'll be able to benefit from in the future. And I have got no doubts that I'll be speaking to you all at some stage uh, in our role in this committee. So again, thank you very much for your your time and for taking part in the meeting and for all the information you gave us. All you need to do now is just hang up and that will be you out. Thank you very much. Hello, Annabelle. Okay, agenda item four is a consideration of negative instruments 129 and 139 as listed on the agenda. And I refer members to paper number three, contains further detail. The instruments are laid under the negative procedure, which means that the provisions will come into force unless the Parliament agrees to a motion to annul them. No motions to annul have been laid. The delegated instrument 129, the delegated powers and law reform committee considered instrument 129 at its meetings on the 12th of May 2020 and determines that it does not meet the usual requirements that at least 28 days should elapse a negative instrument being laid and coming into force. DPLR committee therefore drew the instrument to the attention of the parliament under reporting ground J. DPLR committee also noted that the instrument extends to any event or situation which threatens serious damage to human welfare in a place in the United Kingdom. This means that the instrument went wider in scope than the coronavirus pandemic. The committee asked this committee to consider whether an alternative approach may have been appropriate that would have allowed the full, for the full 28-day scrutiny period in relation to the extension of these matters to non-coronavirus emergencies. The DPLR the committee considered instrument 139 at its meeting on the 19th of May 2019. It reported that this instrument also does not meet the 28-day requirement and drew this attention to the attention of the Parliament, again under reporting ground J. This instrument contains both permanent changes to an existing order and temporary modifications to those changes in response to coronavirus. The DPLR committee invited this committee to consider whether the breach of the 28-day rule was justified in policy terms, particularly in relation to the permanent changes. This DPLR committee also noted drafting errors under the general reporting ground. The Scottish Government has acknowledged this and has undertaken to issue a correction slip. Finally, the DPLR committee noted that there were some words used in the instrument which are not defined. These are set out in the Clark's paper. 
DPLR committee asked this committee to consider whether it was appropriate that the interpretation of these terms be left to the judgment of the local authority rather than the order providing a more specific definition. I put on the record that the committee had the opportunity to consider both these instruments informally at a point when formal committee meetings were difficult. On behalf of the committee, I wrote earlier this week to the Scottish Government referencing these instruments and asking it to be mindful of the importance of granting the Parliament adequate scrutiny time, even during times of urgency. That letter is on our website. Does anyone have any comments on the instruments? Graham? Oh, uh, sorry, Annabelle. Annabelle had put in an R. My apologies, I hadn't seen it. Annabelle first, and then Graham. Thank you, Kendira. Um, just so on the first SSI 2012, I think it is General Committee of Development. As far as I recall, we actually had discussed this at committee some weeks ago. Uh, I can't remember the date offhand, and and I I recall that we were broadly in agreement with this being put forward. I think the feeling was it was to take into account the Louisa Jordan. Hospital in particular. I'm not quite sure why we're all back again, but anyway, I'm sure that others will have their say. On the second SSI, um, which a number of us raised directly at the preceding evidence session on the homeless persons and suitable accommodation, um, I think it was quite clear that there was support for that. I support it, and I've got no problem with it, and uh, quite happy to just have it noted. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. Uh, Graham? Yeah, thanks, convener. I've got, uh, I haven't got an issue with either of these, but uh, what I do have an issue is, uh, which is the issues raised by the DPLR committee, uh, and it essentially is about loose wording in in these regulations. So on um, number one two nine. I think the DPLR committee is, uh, is entirely right that some of the wording in this does not re does not relate strictly to coronavirus. Um, it just says pre preventing an emergency, uh, reducing or controlling or mitigating the effects of emergency, and this is relation this is in relation to granting planning permission uh, for development. So uh, I think the wording is 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 a little bit vague. And if we look at the the other one, which relates to unsuitable accommodation for homeless people, it uses phrases like short period of time, um, community hosting, um, congregate, large scale, small scale. None of these things are defined, um, and that's the point the DPLR committee was making. I think they're right. Um, so I'm not suggesting we. You know, reject these. No, we shouldn't. But the point needs to be made that when the government is laying regulations like this, they need to get the wording right. Well, it is uh, on the record now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just on Annabelle's point there, I think that this is probably the first time that we have discussed these instruments formally. We may well have discussed them in an informal setting, but given we have only had the two meetings, this is probably the first time that we have raised these uh, in a formal setting. Okay. Um, uh, Andy, you wanted to come in? Yes, thanks uh, very much, convener. Um, in regard to the first instrument, it, it it is a bit regrettable that it it does um, uh, the scope extends beyond the emergency period, and I I think we should be concerned about that because it um, is very broad um, to build things. Um, I mean I've got no specific uh, I'm not specifically suggesting we should do anything um, about it. But, um, I, but if only because we don't know when this crisis is going to end, uh, there may be a second peak um, and all the rest of it. But in due course, let's say in a year, I think we should come back and have a those um, still strictly necessary. On the second order in relation to unsuitable accommodation, I mean, I note the points that the delegated powers 
Law Reform Committee um, have made. And I, I think the fact that phrases like short period of time are not defined is unfortunate. I think it's perfectly OK if government wishes to um, produce some guidance um, on that. But of course, because this is um, an instrument which provides um, places a duty on local authorities to house homeless people, the failure to fulfil that duty is, is um, actionable in the courts. And we've seen action in the area um, over the past year. And therefore, the fact that short period of time or other phrases are not defined could potentially lead to legal problems in relationship to whether or not a local authority is discharged um, its duty. So I certainly think that we should be writing to the minister, expressing concerns about the definitions, saying that these concerns could be overcome with very clear guidance. Um, but beyond that, if they cannot be, then an instrument like this placing important legal duty does not really have terms in it that are open to um, open to very, very wide interpretation. Words like short. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we did we did write to um, to express our concern about the inf uh, about the loose wording, so the government are aware about that thing. The, the the idea of coming back to it in a year. I wonder if what we should do is we should write to the Scottish government and say to them, you know, we've already discussed this, but maybe what we could do is we could uh, ask you to come back and tell us where we are in a year's time, or else we could call them in at that point. But just make the point now that we want to make sure that uh, the terminology has, has firmed up or has only been used as, as it was intended to do, although the loose wording is obviously an issue. OK? Yes, thank you. Much. I, I, if, if I could just come yeah. back to you, convener, just on yeah. one brief point. Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry. I, of course, you've, you, you've written in that regard. I mean, on the first one, I would also note that there is currently I don't know where it is, but there is a review of permitted development rights underway, and so it is a little bit. Um, it is even more unfortunate, if you like, that there are permitted developments being taken forward by this instrument out with the context of that review. Notwithstanding, of course, we do need them for you know emergency pop-up hospitals. Whatever. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Uh, and we we will draft up a letter and uh, let the committee see it before we send it off. OK, thanks very much. Well, I invite the committee then to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations outside of the, the letter in relation to these instruments. Does anyone object to that? OK, in that case, that is agreed. That concludes the public part of this morning's meeting, and I propose we take a five-minute break. Please accept the clerk's meeting request for that discussion, which you are about to be sent. Thanks very much, everybody. Speak to you in a minute.